good morning respected faculty members hello dr satish uh, i am rajesh department of civil engineering kallam harnadre d institute of technology today's speaker is dr prabha mohandas let me introduce about her dr prabha mohandas a senior project officer at iit madras she have taken a leadership role in managing and overseeing projects within the institute this position has allowed her to utilize extensive knowledge and skills in civil engineering to contribute to the successful execution of research and development initiatives and her all round performance award in phd category in iit madras in 2018 and also she got a gold medalist and university university rank holder for the academic year 2011 to 13 and also she secured first rank in uh, her masters in at anna university and also though her uh, diverse roles at iit madras she have gained a comprehensive experience in project management research teaching and academic supports these experience have shaped her into well rounded professional in the fields of civil engineering she holds a phd in civil engineering at the prestigious iit madras and she completed her masters in structural engineering from anna university overall dr prabha mohandas educational background has equipped her with a strong foundation in civil engineering particularly in the areas of concrete structural engineering and pre engineered buildings now i'll hand over this session to dr prabha mohandas thank you madam thank you dr sadish for the uh, nice description so we can start the session right for today so yeah madam we can start screen. you can start the session madam yeah i just want to share the screen okay madam uh, we we'll, we are uh, giving you yeah disable the share So can you please give me access to share the screen? Yeah, yeah, madam. We are giving access to you. Please share the screen. Yeah, fine. I have my uh, screen is visible. Yeah, madam, it is visible. Okay. So today, uh, I'm going to talk about the modern construction materials that we typically use in construction practices, and then technology that we adapted to work sustainably. So is my voice audible to is sir is it clear should i yeah sir yeah madam it is clear fine so now let's we talk a lot about sustainability right the circular economy and sustainability to enhance the performance of these structures so mm. in this lecture i'm just going to touch few details upon the advanced materials that we will be using in the construction practices and then the latest technology that we adopted to enhance the construction and practices and performance of these structures i hope many of you uh, might yeah. i in the technology course so i'll and then the types of reinforcement and these are my uh, general presentation outline so first i'll touch the importance and roles of materials in the construction practices or the structures that we adapt right and then after that i'll be talking about the challenges in meeting the required performance so we tend to construct buildings a lot but then the serviceability of the buildings are still questionable so we construct buildings to last for 100 plus years and then we um, tend to observe a lot of degradation and performance issues so the challenges in meeting the required performance will be addressed and then with advanced concrete systems in respect to of the pre stressed concrete technology and then if in case you know if your structure is repair you know um then the self healing concrete 
would help to enhance the performance and then the current trend on talking about the 3d printing concrete as well this is with respect to the concrete system and when you look at the significance of reinforcement we you know that we have various types of reinforcement various types of rebars that we use in our construction practices so we look at those types as well and in general the practice care that we need to adapt for those reinforcement and then the quality check or the assurance that we can take care to enhance the performance so to start with so you all know that india is witnessing a construction boom so there's a few of you know constructing a few large highway structures sea ports and ports residential and commercial buildings urban and rural project schemes and uh, you know the one of the prime um, theme of the mantra scheme is the housing for all mass construction so in all these things we need in a lot of uh, construction details and then a lot of materials being used so the cost involved in those projects are going to be enormous so it's very important to take care of the construction and the materials that we are going to use in the structure to enhance the performance or to meet the required conditions to stay there for long period if not what happens is that we tend to observe a lot of degradation or issues over the time and we tend to spend a lot of money over the period to keep up the performance of the structure that is one thing or else we don't care of those structures after the construction and that is going to degrade and degrade and the performance is not going to meet and in certain cases we fail you know collapse and a uh, lot of accidental issues as well and which we don't want to occur so what we need to do is we need to keep them safe and usable for a long period say for several decades without much maintenance on them this is what we talk about the sustainability so the sustainability means that whatever that we do so that the, the sustainability is such a beautiful word that we can relate with all our day to day life the sustainable lifestyle and sustainable you know anything so in civil engineering the sustainability is all about you know how long the material can how long the structure can stay how much energy that you can reduce to enhance the performance so how much uh, raw source materials that you can save and how much you know co2 emission can be controlled so everything that put over there is what we call as sustainability so that starts from the scratch to the entire uh, uh, performance of your structure so typically we call cradle to grave performance so from the baby to the in how it is going to perform so the scenario what is a scenario in today's scenario so for example if you take any bridge structures there are some partial data available that was collected from it so this is from uh, the satellite course material you can go through some of the uh, things were from the process phase material so he talks about that um, about the survey of about 1.7 lakhs bridges across india it says that about 6000 bridges are structurally distressed so this is based on the data that was collected by indian bridge management system program and the ministry of road transport and highways how these numbers could be enormous based on you know the real scenario which we could not get the actual data so actually this could be even more because the database itself are inadequate and could be incomplete So if this is the scenario, what about the buildings? So the buildings we don't care, give much care, or the government uh, sectors to take care of the buildings less because it becomes as more of individual property that we need to take care of our buildings. So it's going to be a Herculean task of maintaining such existing structures, especially the infrastructures, and building new ones with durable, um, you know, um, consideration and corrosion resistance in consideration. Why? the corrosion is going to become the attention here is that india is the uh, region where the three side you know over so it, it has a long coastal regions where uh, you know the structure that we are going to construct is going to withstand aggressive environment or it is going to expose to aggressive environment so the care should be given to provide such you know um corrosion resistance performance as well the importance of concrete system is that the reinforced concrete structures are expected to be there maintenance free for the long period however evidence of premature deterioration of modern construct modern structures are being observed and then 
um, the resultant cost of the economy reaching will be about 3 to 5 percentage of the national GNP. In some countries, it is about you know, 50 percentage of the construction budget as well. So, existing knowledge are not adequately applied as well. So now let's talk about the uh, scenarios in concrete, which need, we need to be addressed to take care of the performance. So the different variations and problems in RC members are you have a uh, outside, uh, uh, you know, um, region that is typically called as cover grid. So you might be knowing what is the cover that's provided for a structure when it is being constructed in different environmental conditions, whether it is going to be the environmental conditions mild or severe or moderate. So, depending on that, it is going to be. Madam? Sir, uh, is my slides are moving? No, madam, the slides are not moving. <laughs> okay, I, I'll just check. I'll just stop and reshare it. Yeah. Are you able to see the screen? No, madam, it is not visible. You can uh, restart the slideshow. I thought Just... it is being moved. Because I'm not able to see the chat also. Madam, screen not visible, madam. Is it visible now, sir? Yeah, madam, it is visible. But can you see the screen moving from one slide to the other slide? Uh, no, madam. Okay. Let me share it. I'll better share the entire screen. Are you able to yeah. see now, sir? Yeah, madam. Yeah, it okay. is good. So if there is anything to be, you know, such issues, please let me know. Yeah, madam, sure, we'll let you know, ma'am. Yeah, madam, you can continue. Notification from one of the saying that it is not being moved. Thank you. So in the concrete system, so the better is that. When we talk about reinforced concrete members, you'll be housed inside the concrete. So we typically call, you know, like you can see this rebar placed inside the concrete and then you have your concrete placed here. So the concrete is going to basically cover your rebar and that is why we call this region as the cover creep. So depending on or severe, you vary or you increase the go up to for a cover grid because if you increase too high then it is not good for your concrete why your concrete is weak in compression sorry weak in tension and good in compression so as you increase the depth that concrete region may not withstand the tensile stress then you may end up having a lot of spalling in the cover grid region itself so when the cover grid region spars then that is going to expose you at to the outside environment and then the aggressive agents would react and affect your rebar to induce the durability issues. That is what is being illustrated here. So this dotted line basically indicates the uh, region that is outside. Here you have the concrete surface. So this is going to be exposed to the region where your concrete may get dry and uh, you know the water inside the concrete mix may get you know evaporated over the time. At the same time, so that from the outside environment, you may have increase of aggressive agents like chlorides, water, or carbon dioxide that can come in and that can react or attack your river. So this all depends on the porosity of your concrete and then the connectivity between the porosity, which will lead the path for this aggressive environments to travel through your concrete matrix. So this concrete, typically the cover grid will be like poor quality near surface concrete, and uh, that is why we give a lot of emphasis on. Curing. So you, you need to provide adequate curing so that the evaporation will be from the water that you provide to cure your, you know, concrete, not from the concrete itself. If concrete loses its moisture, then it is going to 
affect the strength gain and the durability also so that is why this becomes curing affective zone if the curing is not done properly right and then this is going to become poor quality to your surface concrete and eventually that will lead to a lot of issues to the river so inside we typically call it as a bulk concrete or the core concrete that is there inside that will have good strength compared to the cover grade so that is why we need to understand that irrespective of the region outer in the quality of the concrete should be good that can be achieved only if you provide adequate curing to enhance the performance for sustainable structures and good quality of the material should be used so which helps you to achieve the required condition so we can divide into two categories one is the concrete system so that depends on the materials what are the materials that you use type of binders or type of contents aggregates admixtures and of course the mix design in which are uh, the proportions that you use to achieve the target goal and at the same time the process that we use to mix your concrete and transport it from one place to the other place and compact it during and temperature and work machines everything will have its impact on the performance so when you consider the environment we can categorize into two categories physical and chemical when you talk about the physical conditions that could be due to abrasion erosion cavitation and freeze thaw cycles as well when you look at the chemical that is about dissolution leaching expansion and alteration so this is because with the aggressive agents that getting into a concrete and that may result in these uh, various conditions so when you talk about the concrete so this is from the um, in book so the concrete structures will be all porous it is a highly heterogeneous materials so the pore connectivity will lead to permeability and then the if the concrete cracks so you can see a mild crack formations if the concrete cracks that may lead to chloride ingress and that may lead to you know oxygen ingress to your material and then depending on the environmental conditions you may have salt water penetration carbonation and water saturations and these are like small condition and if you talk about the pores and due to cracks so the materials that you have may have some alkalic content in cement and then may have some you know the interior may ingredients that we use in concrete so the cement will have alkaline the aggregates may have silica in and depending on the favorable conditions you may end to have a sulfate attack as well so these things when you have the combination of oxygen ingress chloride ingress salt water penetration carbonation that may lead to corrosion issues whereas if you look at the water alkali silica in these combinations so this may result in aggregate react alkali aggregate reaction asr conditions on the hand if you have only the water saturations that may result in leaching and when you have sulfate attack that may result in concrete expansion and eventually that is going to crack your matrix so if that is the case the cracking will be there and that is going to result in strength loss and once that is lost then the material is going to slowly deteriorate so what is the common cause of the materials so sometimes we are not so aware this is from professor bashir and plan you okay so based on the uh, fine you know and it says about the 33 percentage the major contributions are due to corrosion effects the external chlorides would induce the deterioration and the rest of the things were mainly contributed by the shrinkage effects and then the corrosion due to carbonation and alkali aggregate reactions and abrasion and erosion so if you look at the major cause would be like corrosion due to external chlorides and corrosion due to carbonation and corrosion due to inlet chlorides so that is going to influence the durability performance a lot so you might have observed in your uh, day to day life the structures that surround you the corrosion would be one of the common issues that you can find so what are the factors that contribute such concrete deterioration so one is the low cover so typically to save material people don't provide adequate cover as required for a particular scenario or conditions so when you tend to provide low cover considering the cost and the factors as you say you may save cost in the initial stage but at the end you know when you look at the overall the life cycle of your structure or life span of your structure you may need to spend a lot of money at certain interval or frequent day to enhance the performance so low cover is not good so you provide adequate cover so low cover or high cover both extremes are not good so you need to know what are the adequate cover for the 
particular scenario and that need to be provided and then poor quality concrete and poor design detailing and poor workmanship wrong specifications and failure of joint waterproofing and wrong material selection so this all because of the awareness that we have with the world uh, uh, you know um, the work the design people or the site people and then the workmanship so the designers will think this will work but when it goes to the site and the site engineers may not be knowing what exactly the designer thought and included and there there will be a compromise in the performance and especially at the end who is going to construct it the layman is going to do construction and some of the says you may observe that if the concrete is not probable the layman don't even think on you know uh, adding a water he just pours a water to make sure that the water is more probable or something but he doesn't know what he is doing but in if you look at then that is going to change the entire material composition and design and that is going to affect the strength and durability of the material so at the end it is there in the hands of the people who are you know going to do the construction actually so that's where the major thing comes the poor of mansions and wrong specifications so sometimes we need to know what type of material will be suitable for certain applications we cannot use all the materials for all the applications we need to know the pros and cons of the materials and we need to choose the materials appropriately the, so that the material will withstand in certain applications meeting the requirement right so what do we need to consider we need to choose a balanced approach to enhance this this lives when we talk about the balanced approach we need to care of steel so of course we are thinking that the steel is being taken care by the cover grip by covering the concrete on top of it but we are not taking care of the cover grip so we need to look at the service life it has to be balanced we need to take care of the steel as well as the concrete so the steel with enhanced resistance against corrosion and the concrete that is specifically the cover grip with enhanced resistance against the ingress of deleterious elements so this is what considered as energetic effects to be you know look at so why concrete so why do we so you might be uh, so curious to know why concrete is being used tremendously in the construction field that is because if you look at the price of the concrete the concrete is one of the cheaper material that serves for all the purposes so you can this is the range that is given by a code you know you can look at for annual production tens per year ranging from the titanium aluminum steel wood bricks concrete so the concrete production is enormous and the cost is also this so if you look at the energy wise so the energy required for this also says compared to the other materials so thing to note is that to prepare to product produce concrete you need to have some the cement demand across the globe is also given here so you can see around the it's it's just the prediction over the decades ranging from 1990 to 2020 so the uh, china is the highest cement man producer manufacturers and then we have and then other developing country together the cement demand is this so the point here is that the production in cement is enormous and likewise the co2 emissions from the cement is also enormous so when we talk about um, the contributions of the concrete so it is the second highest consumed material next to water so then imagine how significantly we use concrete in all the structures that we use and then the amount of cement that goes in and then the co2 emission in association with it so the sustainability it all is in a talk how well that we can reduce the co2 emissions from the cement and how can make the material be more sustainable so that the desirable qualities you need to enhance the workability for concrete any concrete to perform well the fresh property is the workability and then compressive strength then durability and uh, emotional stability so these are the primary properties of concrete and to adequate you know to develop the infrastructure the concrete has taken out various shapes so ranging from the normal concrete high performance concrete just increases the strength and as a high performance concrete the strength can be tremendously increased so that the size of the member can be reduced to save the uh, that load and then the cost as well then we have precast concrete systems then self sealing concrete and 3d printing concrete right and what about the reinforcements so in reinforcements also we have various evaluation of reinforcements starting from conventional steel rebars then coated steel rebars then frp bars and strands and pre stressing strands 
So Namus Twins Congruent, I don't need to give you any definitions. You might be knowing what Namus Twins Congruent is. So I'll focus on the high performance congruent. So you might be knowing what supplementary cementitious materials, right? So you know, there are materials that possess certain um, characteristics of reaction in, con you know, in the presence of water that to produce the hydration product similar to your cement. So this is what we call supplementary cementitious material and the default reaction is what we call is phosphonic reaction. So the material that attributes this phosphonic reaction is called phosphonic mineral admixtures such as fly ash, GGBS, rice ash hash and silica fume, metacoiline and fume. So the, what is the advantage of using such materials is that so when you use such materials, these are going to be finer than you are. Some materials are finer than you are cement particles so that it will go fill in the pores and that will help you to get a dense packed structures. And some materials will react with the calcium hydroxide in your cement and produce additional CSH and that will also help you to get more pore refinement and get more denser matter. So this requires proper curing to avoid early cracking due to shrinkage and thermal stresses because when you use such materials that you do, they can get properly, then you have ultra high performance from it. So when you have ultra high performance from it, that is going to be based on cementitious composite material when you have certain discontinuous fiber reinforcement based. So the strength typically are in the range of above 120 MV. So nowadays ultra high performance formulas are being used enormously for constructing high rise buildings so that the size of the building can be reduced significantly when you move it to HPC and such things are helpful to reduce the overall dead load of the structures. So the pre and post tracking density strength would be above 10 MPa and this helps you to have enhanced durability because when the strength is increasing, the stiffness of the material will also get increased and then the um, material behaves more stiffer. So adding fibers will help to bridge the cracks and that will help you to enhance the toughness of the material. So that's why in combination of these things will help you to achieve ultra high performance so in, typically here you can see it's a combination of cement and phosphorus, water and of course here the water to achieve the high strength the water cement ratio will be lesser so you need to go with high range water reduces and fine aggregates so you typically reduce the coarse aggregates in this when you need to go with high performance concrete and then the fibers in it to quality. so let us compare the performance of the ultra high performance concrete here so it's a controlled conventional concrete, high performance and ultra high performance concrete. So the strength would be for the conventional concrete in the range of 20 to 50 and for high performance concrete it is about 80 and for this ultra high performance concrete, this is rapid powder concrete that is mentioned, it's about 200 MPO also. And flexural strength it is 2 to 4 and here it is 7 and ultra high performance concrete is about 10 times the conventional strength that we have and modulus of elasticity in the range of 34 conventional, 44 high and about 60 twice the conventional strength for the ultra high performance concrete. So these structures will be very helpful when you need to have a no abrasive wear in structures and then when you in such scenarios the water absorption will be 7 times slower and rate of corrosion will be 8 times slower and chloride ion diffusion will also be less. So the fibers are basically, you know, helping the enhance the uh, performance. So this is uh, what here it is expressed here. So after this, the concrete has a major role and then the fibers will start bridging the cracks and that increases the toughness in your material. So now let us talk about the self-healing concrete. So what is so special about the self-healing concrete? So especially when you need to take care of these structures, for example, the dishes. So you construct it and you construct it there for 100 plus years, but after 10 years or 15 years, you start observing some, you know, issues with those structures due to material or that could be due to construction or any inefficient design appropriateties could be. So in such cases, when you have the such self-healing boundary, so it repairs itself. How does it repair on its own? There are two types of healing. One is autogenous, another one is autonomous. So when you talk about autogenous, it is about the inherent ability of your material to do healing on itself. So cementitious materials that is for the, so when you talk about the cement, so not all the cement particles will get completely hydrated when you do the process. There will be some unhydrated particles also. So 
when you have a crack and when the unwanted particles are exposed to the region and especially if there is a water and they tend to react and then form further gels to fill up the crack so that comes into the autogenous healing and autonomous healing there is a um, trigger so you activate something so that there is some reaction that will be induced to repair the crack so embedded unconventional engineered additions rather than unhydrated cement It has the potential to repair larger cracks. So these things, so you can now you can use self healing as a control measures. This would be capable of repairing cracks within a few hundreds of micrometers. Meaning, if you have a structural damage, which is in some several, uh, you know, um, among crack wave or uh, cracks falling or something, in that cases, this will not be helpful. This is at the maintenance and control purpose. So, in the initial stage, if we have such uh, mechanisms that will help you to reduce the cracks, minor cracks, which further will be prevented to have a crack growth that will result in a severe crack in the later stage. So, if we look at the mechanism of autogenous healing, so we can classify this into three categories: one is physical cause, then chemical causes, then mechanical causes. The physical cause, what happens basically, is just the swelling. So some material gets in and it swells. So as it is going to react, there will be a continuation of the hydration, and as it is going to, you know, hydrate more and more, that is going to produce the hydration products, and those products will fill up the crack. So this is one way. And the mechanical causes, if you have originally in the presence of water, and that is going to break some fine particles, and that is going to accumulate over the time, then that is going to fill up this space. So, if you look at the you know external categories, the um, performance of healing materials in self-healing concrete is that you can have some concrete with mineral admixtures. The crack after damage is induced. And then now you can see the expansive wages. You can fill some geomaterial swell that can, you know, eventually swell and fill up the crack. And this expansive material agents and geomaterials and carbonates eventually fill the crack completely. Right. Similarly, here you have damaged ECC of crack with less than 60 micrometers. So in this case, if you have a healing product that would fill up the cracks when it is being exposed to the water and the air, this is how your structure is going to look at. So the lesser size of cracks means lesser amount of healing material, which is in turn required to higher healing efficiency. So the self-healing concrete concept works better when you have less smaller cracks, and over the time, the smaller crack will be for you know controlled to or that will help to prevent the crack growth or severe crack formations because of that reason. Right? So what are the latest technology that we use? The current practice is that 3D printing concrete technology. So we are so tend to you know print or we are so tend to get some 3D models or those things commercially available for all the applications. So when you look at our civil engineering applications, is it possible to you no know, print a house or print a model something that huge to a real scenario? So this, if we talk these things 20 years or 30 years back, people might have said it's new. It's a big no. It's all start with a small, you know, innovations and connecting things here and there. So that's how Mr. Steranath Brophy and Fused Disposition has prevailed over 1980s. But in those times, that was not popular in construction industry. And Kosinas, so he is the pioneer in this area called the counter drafting. So he related the potential of this additive manufacturing technology to the construction field. And later, a lot of people start working on how this um, technology would be helpful for the construction field. And they have come up with extrusion-based 3D printing models. Where synthesis materials will be passed through a nozzle, and the nozzle will be sprayed or you know deposited to the required. So in 1920-40. So in 2014, Vincent printed two-story building houses in a Chinese construction company. What is the advantage of using 3D printing concrete? So it increases the geometrical freedom and reduces the human labor, and thus the uh, work, poor workmanship thing. And it's fast in time effective and low risk, etc. So you can look at it. So this pie chart 
chase you. If you go with 3D printing concrete, you can save the labor cost for form work would be about 50 percent each. And this one, it's a concrete material cost would be 30 percent each. When you go with um, 3D printing concrete, we avoid those aggregates, right? And then um, the concrete labor cost. So the labor required to concreting will also be same. And then the material cost for form work, you don't need form work at all, right? So those things will be same. How does this work? So this is based on a rheology and then um, you need to customize the rheology of the material. So the additive materials that you use in the cementitious material that should have a free flowability so that when you um, spray the concrete that can freely flow, it comes through the nozzle and it is being placed to the layers and required shapes. So if you look at the um, material behavior, the yield stress and viscosity are the two primary uh, properties that we need to look at, which should be low during pumping while immediately after the position, yield stress should be higher of magnitude. And this is achieved by adding an additive. The additives should control the um, flowability of the um, um, you know, mix that is going to come through the nozzle which increases in yield stress and elastic modulus. So accelerators can be added so that the strength gain will be significantly high. So the um, layers can withstand there once it has achieved the strength. The most common method for accessing is that extrudability is based on printing a filament layer. So in that case, when you do it, you can visually examine the uh, layers as well. Is there a sign of blockage or tears or discontinuity? The buildability is depends on the number of layers that you construct for the printed formation. There are test methods available to check the conditions and then you know to ensure the performance of this additives that is coming through the nozzle is appropriate or not. So based on this technology in India, Sciatium startup builds India's first 3D printed form, printed house in 2017, and then later it's a house in IIT Madras. And there is a startup who works exclusively on this. So that's why now he, the company has worked, drawn a lot and they do a lot of uh, 3D printing working across the India. So in this, from their study, they have found out that using this 3D printing form technology cuts down the construction short cost by 30%. So recently you might all be aware of this India's first 3D printed post office. This is being constructed in Bangalore by LNT construction. So it is a 1,100 square feet structure which was constructed about 20 lakhs in 45 days. So the advantage of this 3D printing technology is that you can uh, construct the um, building in very few days. But then the planning should be done properly. So the planning and designing should be done properly to execute the things. But when it comes to the execution stage, you can you know implement in a very short span. And then the cost involved also less because you uh, optimize the materials and you cut down the labor requirement as well. And another major uh, advantage is the aesthetic coupling of the structures. So you can use the best of concrete when you go with 3D printing because concrete is good in compression. So when you curve it or when you do these abstractions, you are going to make use of this compression effect. So you will be, you know, better using the concrete at the same time, you are enhancing the aesthetic appearance of your structure. There is another footbridge in ETH juries. So you can see the um, shape of the structures, how you know unique these structures are. Similarly, nowadays, a lot of you know 3D printing um, structures are being constructed, and there is one uh, la largest bridge is constructed in China. So the whole concept here is that when you go with such things, initially you may not be using reinforcement and you may not you are reducing the cement content as well. So these things will eventually lead to approaching sustainability practices. So this is with the concrete. So now let us look at certain uh, practice that we can adapt for steel rebars that will be helpful to meet the quality conditions or assurance. See, sustainability comes when you do a proper quality control and assurance as well. Because by doing it, you are making sure the structure is going to stand for a long period without any energy required from the surroundings or without any you know, harm to the external surroundings or trouble or whatever that uh, you know that is going to affect the functionality of your structure. So now we look at the thermomechanically treated or 
quenched self-tempered bars. So you might be all aware of what TMT bar is. And many of you know how the TMT bars are being manufactured and what are the key things that you look at. So in sum, I will quickly tell you how what is the process that is involved in the making of TMT and what are the things that we need to look at when you need to qualify or when you need to assure the quality of your TMT bar. So you know, you can see this process table. So the temperature will be initially increased significantly high and then it will be quenched. Then it will be kept in the atmospheric condition. So it will be tempered. So by doing this process, you know, your surface will be, you know, immediately you can see the effect of this whole temperature process here. After rolling, you may have the both surface and both material will be the astronaut. And in the quenching valves, what happens to your surface becomes, you know, the immediately quenched. So that becomes martensite and your core will still be in the astronaut stage. And when it is being kept in the tempering bed, so now this is going to slowly, you know, emanate the temperature from the surface to the inside. So the tempered, the martensite will become as a tempered martensite. And still your core will remain as the astronaut. When it becomes, you know, when you do a cooling process, so my tempered martensite will be still the same and slowly the temperature from the surface is going to get penetrated to your thing so that it will be disseminating the, sorry, the coolness will be disseminating through that. So the core becomes the ferritin ferrin. So when you cut and look at the cross section of your TMD, you'll be having the inside ferret pearlic face and then the outside tempered martensite face. So this is what we call it as TM ring. Right? So TM means tempered martensite. So it forms a ring around this pore. So that is what we call it as TM ring. So to qualify the uh, TMD bar, we do check for TM ring formations. So before getting into that, I'll just briefly tell you the advantages. When you go with TMD compared to your conventional bars, it will have low cost and high strength. And mainly it has enormous ductility that is good for the earthquake prone regions. And the elongation will be about 80 to 30 percent ratio. Right, and since there is no cold working and it provides better corrosion resistance also. So how to identify or select the TMD bars? So when you need to select TMD bars, you need to select uh, only if the hardened periphery and soft cores are uniform and concentric. So when you do the check, so I will explain you the TM ring test as well. So when you do the TM ring test, you need to have the TM ring formation on the outer surface and you need to have this FE phase in the core. But it should be the consistency. So there should be allowable range. So typically when we go talk about this hardened phase. So hardened phase is here is that the TM ring. So the TM ring should be ideally about 20 to 30 percentage of the total cross section. And then the inner section should be more than 60 percentage so that the ductility will be. Low. If it is not the adequate level, then you may compromise the ductility. So these things can be identified using TM ring test. So now what is TM ring test? So for doing TM ring test, so you cut the rebar and place it in this form. So you prepare the surface, you cut it and you polish it and that will be exposed to 5% of nitrile solution for 5 minutes. So once you do that and you can see the phase distinction between the outer TM ring and then inner FP phase. So to be more clear, so you can keep this prepared specimen under this testing adjustments, sorry, testing setup. So you can see uh, arrangements for, you know, looking at the details of your specimens. So you have a camera and you have a light placed on it. So the image under the specific lighting conditions will be helpful to look at the TM outer and FP inner phase. So here, these are some examples where you can see a good TM bars and poor TM bars. So nowadays you might have seen a lot of advertisement saying that the TMD bars are qualifying the TM ring test. So those are based on this test methods. You cut it, then you see the microstructure to indicate the TM ring outer surface and FP inner surface. So this shows a good uniform hardened outer surface of the TM face and then inner core FP face. Whereas here, this is an example for the poor quality rebar. So the ring is not uniform or uh, you know, consistent around these things. So here you can see the thickness of the ring is less. Here again, you can see there is no TM at all. And here you can see the same scenarios. So these indicates, the red dots indicates the peripheral regions with imperfect TM phase. So better quality control of TM scale is essential 
through regulations and more awareness. So Professor Pillai extensively works in this um, TMD, uh, uh, you know, uh, quality assurance testing. So test method is also proposed on, on the same TM ring test, a quality control test for TMD bars. So now uh, we were when we, we did we collected a lot of you know rebars from different manufacturers to check how well our bars are in our market and to come up with that what we observed is certain manufacturers are doing good and then the products from those manufacturers are you know satisfying the required conditions or criteria by providing a uniform TM ring with the proper soft AC. Whereas these other manufacturers, the quality is not met. That is because um, the awareness is not reached that well to ensure that the phase should be in this range and then the TM ring should be this range. The one interesting fact is that this is more irregular when the diameter of the rebar is less. As the diameter is increasing, this would be controlled a bit better. Other than that, so the TM bars and those things, we need to have a surface cracking check. What we need to do is we have to bend the crack and see if there is any cracking on the surface or not. So we bend the bars like this. You can see the cross section here. So this is a good um, cross sectional bar. When you bend a group, good cross sectional bar, you will not see any cracking on the surface. Whereas if the cross section is not good, that is if the TM ring is not uniform and when you bend it, then you will be seeing a lot of severe cracks like this. So this is going to affect the durability performance of your structure when these parts are going to be used in such applications. There is another thing to notice that these bars are going to be used as stirrups also, right? When you have, when you are going to use stirrup, you are going to bend the bars like this, and when you bend it, and there will be a crack, right? So, as a quality control check, the board suggests you to bend at 135 degree angle. And if there is no crack, then it is good to be used as a shear with stirrups. If there is a crack, then you need to be precautious and you need to take additional care to prevent any issues. And especially when you are going to use it in the earthquake prone regions, right? So in such cases, these things are very crucial. So how do you do the bend test? So IS1608 gives you the specifications to do the bend test. So when you do a bend test, you know, the specimen is considered to pass the test if there is no crack or rupture. So you have a mandrel diameter like this. So you keep your rebar going through that and then you bend it to 135 degrees Celsius. The mandrel diameter should not be too large. So you have to keep a relationship between your rebar diameter and then the mandrel diameter, which will be bent to induce the stress on the surface. Now, additional uh, another technology is that you know we know the conventional rebars when it is being exposed to the um, chloride or moisture or oxygen that is going to result in corrosion. So how can we control it better? So we can coat it, and right? so that's how this coated technology has come up. So it has come up as a protect protection mechanism. You can see here this is your uh, steel rebar, and then the, you have a coating, and then you will be having your coating. So in this case, the protection mechanism is that first of all, you have a concrete as your cover fit to protect your rebar. In addition to that, you have a coating. So even though if there is something that comes in through your concrete, you have your coating to be, you know, protected between uh, the coating to be protected, you know, protecting your rebar from the external source. For example, if this coating is not there, if there is a hole or if there is any, you know, path in which the aggressive agent can get in and that can get into your steel, that's where the problem comes. Right? So we'll address such things in the coming slides. So the concept here is that the protection mechanism is to eliminate the direct contact between the metal and electrolyte and then reduce the reduction in the driving potential by the protection flame around the steel surface. And in this case, when you have such arrangements, there will be a reduction in oxygen supply. So people thought these things will be very good to protect your steel and this production technology has come up. And you can see a lot of um, manufacturers in India who use the same coating process as well. So how it is being coated? So it's a blast field. So once you get your rebar, epoxy resin powder is ionized and attracted to the steel surface by electrostatic force. Then you do water quenching in a thermosetting polymer. 
and then you do inspect. So here, this person is doing inspect for holiday or damage. So holiday is not the holiday that we usually take. It is the name that is given to the pin holes or micro, you know, damages. So that need to be inspected. So for a certain length, you you have some allowable limit of the holidays or damage to have that is less than one point one percentage or something. So if it is more, then that is going to accelerate the behavior or the corrosion in a negative way. So here is the thing. So it is the microscopic image of the coated surface. You can see a small pin holes. So these are called the damages or the holidays. So when you do inspect, how do you do it? So you have a sponge and then you have this wire brush and this will be connected to it. And then you check it and this will indicate the you know, indication of the damages on the surface. There are a lot of core practices also we observe in site. So mostly rebars are cut at sites. So when you do cut at the sites, there is a possibility if the coating is thickness is more, they may get peeled off. If it is peeled off and people may not think further, you know, uh, they just tend to fix it then and there and they are recoating. And the recoating is going to affect the performance mostly. So the curved surface is applied using a simple vein brush. The site at ambient temperature conditions. So, fusion bonding will not occur at ambient temperature conditions. So, these things will not go into serve the purpose. So, the advice is that the FPC rebars must not be cut and bent at the site and must be handled delicately to avoid surface damages. So, typically, manufacturers, you know, they do supply the materials in required bent angle, or if you need to have the bars as a stirrups, you can give your specifications. They can, you know, bend the bars to the required uh, geometry or those things, and those things can be done in the manufacturer unit itself. Why? Because they'll do all the process before the coating itself. The bending will be done before the coating, so that once it is bent, then it is easy and smooth to coat. So the coat will stay further. But here you can see you have a straight bar, and then the uh, practice practices just want to. Use this as a side, you know, stirrups, and they are bending it at the side. So when you bend it, what's going to happen is that the bent regions are going to crack because you are having some uh, epoxy material on top of the uh, steel, and when you bend it, the steel can withstand the bend, but the coating cannot, and that will have such poor cracking on the surface. So when you have such cracking, and that is going to accelerate the corrosion process by inducing more anode cathode. Or the ratio between the anode cathode will be higher and that will accelerate the pro problem. So, additional epoxy coating using simple paint pressure at ambient temperature does not lead to fusion bonding and it should be avoided. So, there is a study and which says the service life of this epoxy fusion based epoxy coated with the steel rebar. So, the, you can see this is the uncoated rebar and this. Fire is the coated rebar without damage. And again, when you have this uh, coated rebars exposed to the atmospheric conditions being right in the site for long duration, there will be a degradation due to ultraviolet sunrise and there will be a degradation due to direct sun exposure as well. So this indicates the no damage and this indicates ultraviolet damage and this SD condition basically indicates the surface damage of your rebars. So when you have surface damage and ultra high violet exposure, then the performance is going to be less compared to your uncoated bar itself. The probability of the failure with respect to the age of the structure will be more when you have damaged epoxy coated rebars or when you have, you know, Epoxy coated rebars. So uh, the rebars with coating will perform better only when you are taking care of it properly with no damage. So it is like when you can give a proper control or care to a or a rebar, then you can go with epoxy coated rebar. If you cannot take care of it, then it's better not to use your rebar and you can go with the conventional rebar for the purpose so that the, the consequence will be less compared to the consequences of the using rebar with damages. So here you can see some premature corrosion happened due to such poor practices of epoxy coating bars. The more damage to use damaged epoxy coated steel bars than the conventional uncoated steel bars. 
and in addition to that nowadays we are working a lot um, using this gfrp bars the gfrp bars technology is something that um is being the regular uh, construction practices in many developed countries but in our country we are yet to adapt such gfrp or frp bar usage in our construction practices and we have a um, building code that is being in uh, um no process soon that will be released which gives you the specifications and test methods for gfrp bars from um, bis so you can see here the how do you manufacture the gfrp bars you have the fibers you have polymer matrix and you place these things together you can get the frp composite so unlike steel rebar the conventional rebar your frp composite frp bars are a composite material so it depends on the material properties of the two different you know matrix of fibers and polymers but the advantage is that you can have uh, less weight the so gfrp is like in weight and it can be customized to any lens or bends and shape and this is one of the alternative solution when you think the corrosion is the issue so it's non conductive to electricity and heat and brittle non metallic and it concern is that the chemical attack that it will be undergoing so when it is a highly alkaline environment that the performance of gfrp is bit uncertain otherwise where you feel the corrosion is the issue the gfrp bars can be used and there are for some projects who started using gfrp bars for non structural applications so this can be used in structural applications as well with certain conditions right so let us compare the cost variations between the we are uh, no different rebars so when you have the conventional steel rebar the cost ratio will be one so as the you um, know the performance increases if you are providing a corrosion resistant steels or coated bars or galvanized core or gfrp bars the cost will tend to increase when you use gfrp bars you may have three times the cost of your conventional bars when you use solid stainless steel the cost will be even more higher so these things can be chosen having the um, capital cost in mind and having the importance and significance of the performance of the structure in mind so though you spend more money in the initial stage of capital cost you may save a lot of materials considering the overall cycle of the structures so the durability and life cycle cost must be also be considered while choosing the materials right so this is the key thing to take out so you need to know which material performs better for certain applications so you should not think about the cost as one of the criteria in the initial stage because you should look at the holistic performance of your structures to look at the life cycle cost so i'll just briefly touch upon a concept on the pre tension permit aspect so far we have looked at the various materials that we use for the constructions in point of concrete and steel so now let's see what is this pre stressed concrete applications so might be some of you might be handling pre stressed concrete technology so you can see the evaluation of pre stressed concrete technology how tremendous it has evolved from 1950s to the current scenario So nearly 65% of all new bridges are constructed using pre-tension concrete technology, owing to its advantage of having long members, slender members, and uh, making you know uh, reducing the cracks. All those things. But then we have observed certain few you know issues with pre-tension concrete system itself. This is one of the bridges in this connecting the Pohai to Pohai in Mumbai that has lot of such shear cracks formations in all the girders, almost all along the length of the span. so what could be the reason so we cannot unless we examine the structures we cannot provide a solid reason but then by looking at the possibilities it could be due to poor construction practices or, or especially since it's a shear region the shear contribution will be less so that could be governed by the transmission length and bond strength aspect so if this is the case for the pre tension boundary bridges how about the similar scenario for other pre tension systems so other common application of such technology is in hollow core slabs which is being used in the commercial buildings or high rise buildings so one thing that we are observe is that the code recommendations are not updated so the existing codes or test methods have its limitations so we need to come up with a method which can estimate better transmission length and bond strength so that such scenarios can be controlled similarly this is the case for the railroad ties 
the only difference is that the diameter of the strand that will be used in this railway rides will be lesser than the one that will be used in bridge deck and the buildings and here we even here in this railway railroad ties we have observed a lot of issues seating bottom test due to poor bond performance so what we observe is that the bond mechanism in free tension pumping system is mainly governed by adhesion friction and mechanical interlock and when you talk about the strands the mechanical interlock plays major role so the difference between the plain wire and strand is that so when you have this strand the after peak the resistance to the slip will be enhanced better in the friction the effect will be due to the wedge action at the end there will be a higher effect that enhances the confinement and you will be having a mechanical interlock as well so the helical shape of the strand would tend to increase the strength so in pretension pumping system you have a you have a bed here and you have a strand and you will be stressing using the jack and the stress will be transferred slowly from the end to the member over the length that then is called transmission length the length required to transfer the stress from zero to effective pre stress and then the length stress will be maintained so now this structure is going to expose to the environment service condition under the service condition the stress will be activated and there will be increase from the effective to ultimate stress the length required for reaching this effective to ultimate is what bond length and together the length required to reach the ultimate stress is what development length so you might be knowing the development length requirement for achieving the i you know complete utilization of your strength or you or you know to develop the strength required especially for the flexural member so in the liquid bond will result in increased transmission length and when it is being increased and it will reduce the shear and structural performance in the critical regions especially in against the anchorage reinforcement so crucial that depends on the transmission length of your member so the ma major factors that influence the transmission lengths of the compressive strength of concrete pre stress level diameter of strand surface condition of strand releasing methods and time dependent methods but you know um when you consider the coded recommendations not all the factors are being considered especially the australian canadian and indian code so that talks about the transmission length with respect to only the diameter of the strand so if you change the concrete strength or if you change any one of these factors you will be end up having the same transmission length but the real scenario is not the same so it is using this equations are not appropriate whereas the euro code and fib code that gives you the um, scenario of all the factors to be considered which could influence the transmission length so adapting this would be more effective or approachable but then we need to look at the factors that are considered is it good or bad so sometimes we tend to add more factor of safety so that if something goes wrong there will be something to take care of this structure that's how the design code rules but that is not always true and especially for the pre tension concrete system we should not work in their point of view i will tell you why so in pre tension concrete system underestimating and overestimating both are going to crucial of course you all know we should not underestimate the required parameter will be you know short of the tech factor whereas when you overestimate it we think that is adequate to provide enough safety but that is not for the pre stress case so here is the scenario collected from the literature and then the research from that it indicates that compressive strength has a significant influence on the transmission length likewise surface condition also has significant influence on the transmission length and i'm talking about the transmission length i'll tell you how to measure the transmission length also it is basically you are measuring the strain on the concrete surface that would be using strain gauges or using demel pins or using dic techniques so from this you measure the change in distance and then you calculate the strain and you plot the graph i'll just illustrate you the ways in sequence at which the process in you know used to prepare these specimens you have a pre stressing bed and you have a mold placed then you pre stress the strands using the hydraulic jack and other accessories required to activate the stresses and you concrete it and cure it 
then you cut the sample and in this method i placed inbuilt dmf pins which is required to which is required to you know um, measure the strain on the concrete surface you will not be measuring the strain you calculate the distance and distance and then you calculate the uh, strain so these are the the initial trains are uh, obtained and from the uh, obtained result so you can see the 95 percentage average maximum strength method is used to get the transmission length using various length of concrete so it is summarized in this plot this indicates when you change the compressive strength the transmission length is gradually decreasing so from 23 to 45 mbo of the strength at the time of release the reduction in the compressive strength is about 36 percentage so likewise the Stress effect is also induced, and from this result, the bipolar model is proposed to the board to enhance the determination of transmission length. So, similarly, based on the model, this was compared with the uh, other standards as well. From the comparison, it is understood that our Indian code underestimates the uh, value significantly, and there are codes that overestimate the values, and there are codes. That overestimates, but that is not being constant and that is not reliable all the time to go with. So, there's underestimation and overestimation of the transmission length is not always good for retention concrete system. So, let us understand how the bond mechanism is being affected. For conventional strength concrete, you all know that we can do the bond strength by you know pulling a pull out test. Casting a simple cube specimen embedded in the sorry cube specimen with embedded rebar, and this will be placed in one end, and you will be applying a pulling force at this end and try to pull the rebar out from the concrete. The bond criteria failure criteria used for the rebar so are 2.5 mm slip at free end, and first slip at the free end will be measured, or can these be adapted for the stands? It cannot be adapted. There are people who researchers worked on several methods to come up with the specific test methodology that can be used for pre-stressed concrete. So the Mustafa test method is for a complete concrete block in which stands are embedded, and then jack will be placed to pull out the stand. But here the disadvantage is that the stands are not pre-stressed. And there is a test method ASPM A1081. Again, here the scenario is use the unstressed stands in cement grout and here also it is not mimicking the scenario of pre-tension concrete system. So then you cannot test method come up with some imaginary faults. So it is adapted uh, anchorage measurement access method. So this setup is basically replacing the stiffness of the entire remaining length of the specimen. So this involves a lot of complications and is expensive also. So we decided to come up with simple test method for determining the bond criteria. And based on that, the simple test method is proposed and uh, one meter long, this specimen is cast with stressed member. So the stress level is 0.7 FPU. And then the whole setup is placed in this uh, UHMD solution to do the pullout test. And this end is fixed. And then it will, when it is being moved here, the stands are being pulled out from this end and two measuring devices are placed at the ends to measure the slip on the end of the members. So two different pre stress levels were considered, two different embedded lengths were considered. From the testing, we understood the uh, behavior of the stands in concrete and from the behavior, the failure criteria for the test methods are also come up with and proposed. So we understood that when the tensile stress increases, bond stress is increased. And then when the length is increases also, bond stress is being increased. So this is for the short span, this is for the long span. So from this, you know, um, when we use the effect of uh, LE, the effect of You know, the, the defining method is, you know, very good. Instead of 2.5 mm slip, you consider the change in point where the behavior changes. So by considering that, we could eliminate the um, total embedment length and we can eliminate the effect of pre-stress. 
those things could be minimized. So if you look at the bond uh, uh, stress definition using 2.5 mm slip and yield stress method, here the 2.5 mm slip and yield stress methods are giving almost the similar results. So when using 2.5 mm slip method, so the hollow regions are basically 2.5 mm slip method. So the strength, the effect of the length of compressive strength cannot be ignored. Whereas if you consider the uh, yield stress method, there is like bend over point, if you consider the change in moment, then the effect of the length and the uh, free stress levels are being minimized. So in that case, the, you know, or the scatter is also lesser and the effect is also achieved better. So from the complex test method, we could propose the, some simplified test methods using this 90 percent yield stress method. And from this, we could understand some bond failure criteria at the interface as well. So for a helical shaped stands embedded in concrete, the bond failure is different. So you have a shear key form and as the stands are being, being pulled out, these shear keys also you know, getting deformed and partially the shear keys are getting cracked at the initial stage and here you can see the shear keys are completely cracked and this is going to kind of give you a pipe formations in which the strands are going to pass through smoothly. The damage of concrete key, a smooth path resulting a load failure. So from this to summarize is that we looked at several modern material, modern techniques that enhances the concrete properties and material specifications and testing specifications required for steel rebars as well as the FRP rebars and then the use of you know, application of PTC systems and then test methods for bond testing for pretension concrete systems how to reduce the complex method to simplify your standard test method that anyone can be anyone can adapt to ensure the quality of the Born inside. So that I'll thank. I'll conclude the uh, presentation. So we can ask for any discussions or interactions. Well, that's a wonderful session, madam. We want to thank all the participants of this program, and I would like to. Uh, this session is open for any queries. Hello, good morning, madam. Yes, good morning. Yeah, madam, you told that the I performance concrete, madam, uh, that is a grade of uh, above yeah. 120 grade. So, is there any quadal provisions you will going to follow to design the I performance concrete, or uh, that is uh, fully based on the trial and mixes, madam? So for high performance concrete up to MEAD, our regular uh, code uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is yes, madam. So for high, high performance concrete, the code regulations are in uh, process. So soon we will be having it. There are um, certain code, the ATA codes can be uh, followed and uh, some literatures can be referred. But currently we don't have a specific code to be followed for UHPC. Yeah, okay, madam. And one more thing, in the case of uh, self-healing concrete, what is the minimum grade of concrete we will go into off, madam? A self healing concrete, I'm not currently working on it. So, to start with, maybe you can start with M40, M30, uh, okay. the minimum grade of concrete, and you can enhance it better. Yeah, okay. And in the, in the case of uh, special types of mineral armatures, you are mentioned that one image uh, that is uh, POFA, madam, POFA, POFA is one of the image you are shown in the like uh, fly ash uh, ggbfs and uh, the the admixtures that we use okay okay so it's uh and, uh, and you are showed that the ash comma in fuel ash that we can use as one of the supplementary cementitious materials that has a uh, tendency to react and uh, produce hydrated particles Okay, okay. Madam, you are showing the majority of the cuts images are very good, madam. But uh, as I watched the, you are mentioned also the years, madam. I think some images are uh, around 2000 and 2013. Already one decade is odd, madam. 
so yeah. after that uh, is there uh, i think so much of uh, what we call uh, the improvement is uh, i think they are made yeah so the sustainability is something that we give attention in the recent times so we really yeah. need to work a long uh, way to go and reach this so we need to you know do a lot of research and come up with some findings to update things so it, it has to be updated okay okay so a lot of participation from our industry and academia should take part and do things to enhance it further and in india we really lag uh, certain things compared to the developed countries so we are uh, learning the good practices that is being adapted there and we are trying to implement here and more let's yes, see five ten years you can see a huge transition in the construction industry here uh, yes madam and in the case of uh, 3d printing concrete also i think it is not a uh, it is a uh, Yeah, it is not an economical it is uh, you are no, already mentioned uh, you have some... to think you have to think the holistic service uh, life of this sector initial cost analysis i saw on image where you are posted the indian post office uh, that is the yeah. 1200 square feet and the cost is uh, around 27 lakhs yes they are not sustainable okay okay madam thank you wonderful session madam okay thank you thank you thank you thank you madam one more question one of our participant has been posted please yes, tell us about the hardened properties of 3d printed concrete the hardened properties of 3d printed concrete are being in serine so we do check the fresh properties and compressive strength of the concrete will be tested and uh, um, a lot of research is going on to come up with the defining the um, mechanical properties of 3d printing concrete and we uh, now recently bis is working on developing uh, the properties for 3d printing concrete as well so once the code has come out then we will get a clear idea of what or how to you know uh, what properties that we have to look at this methods to adapt to check the specifications of this Good morning, ma'am. Hello. Good morning. Yeah, uh, you are audible. Yeah. 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 What material is used for the 3D printing right now? There is one question, and as far as the right now, the uh, yeah, the conventional cement uh, particle, you know, cement and then fine uh, um, particles, fine aggregates, will be used. So the coarse aggregates we typically right. avoid, and with the admi- you know, admixtures, uh, we need to use this full precipitator, and then the viscosity modifying agents because the flowability needs yeah, to be yeah, controlled. Yes. So, Mixtures we will use, and then the cement, the main ingredient, and a bit of uh, some amount of water, and mixtures. It's the main composition that will uh, use the three different ingredients. Okay, so cement, fine aggregate, and uh, BME, that's all. Okay, and super plaster. It is BME and super plaster in relation to cement and uh, fine aggregate. Yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah, this color is good. Okay. okay. And second one is you are talking about uh, in one of the slides in the earlier slides uh, about the energy embedded energy or energy component. Um, different materials are compared, and the content is very low compared to all other materials, steel and other materials. But uh, have one question that the quantity to be used also is the, uh, to be compared because. Uh, one ton of yeah, steel suppose we use concrete, it may be 100 to 200 tons is required. for the same performance so that is one point i would like to get clarified so this is with respect to the quantity or which it is being used the amount of uh, volume so com- comparing to that the energy uh, release was compared so as i mentioned concrete is the highest consumed material next to water so imagine the production of the concrete and then the cost involved with it so in that way it is compared with the other material 
I, I did I compared with titanium and aluminum, and the cost and production rate for those things, and uh, the cost and production for the concrete. Okay. Uh, did I answer your question? Is this what you asked? I think you compared the energies, energy levels. Energy yeah, that is very simple from the pressure to sensitize the amount of concrete that is being used and then the amount of energy required for the production. Yeah, for the production that's fine. If you compare literally one ton of cement and one ton of steel or aluminum or other material to compare, concrete, uh, it requires very low energy. But the quantities when you use in the market, huge quantities are required. For example, a steel section of high section, whatever the load carrying capacity is, that correspond to that concrete it is more than 10 times it requires, more than 10 times or 20 times it requires the quantity to carry the same load or something. Yeah, like. I so agree. That yeah. this will be taken into account. Yes. For sustainable. Right, madam, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, madam. Hi, good morning. Actually, I want to know whether there are any uh, softwares. If your voice is not clear, can you please be? Are there any softwares uh, related to the durability assessment that is corrosion, uh, say about uh, uh, ingress of your... Uh, uh... There is one software in the name of Life365. So that uh, it's a free downloadable software. So that gives you... You know, if you have a concrete and rebar, and if you provide the uh, a coefficient of the mic, you know, a diffusion coefficient, and then the exposure conditions or the power depth, and then will roughly estimate the service life of your structure. Uh, so you can explore the solution. Yeah. For the chloride ingress, uh, also software is available. For chloride so ingress, not the chloride ingress. Based on the chloride content or the chloride ingress, you can detect the remaining service life of the structure. Okay. Madam, kindly name the software, madam. Life 365. So I can post it here. Life 365 is the. Okay. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Uh, madam, another question, uh, like bond strength between the layers for 3D printed concrete. Yeah, that is one of the things that is still need uh, more uh, detailed study. So far we are getting, uh, so that is based on the yield stress and the shear strength between the layers. That is adequate enough, but how well that can be maximized or enhanced that is all in state. So any queries, participants, can you please, uh, if you have any queries, you can ask. Uh, yeah. Okay, madam, the, I think there is no any questions regarding this seminar. Okay, great. Okay, madam, thank you. Fine, sir. So you please share the feedback as well with me as well. Yeah, sure, madam. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, madam. And tomorrow also we'll uh, start the session at eleven o'clock. Fine. I'll take leave, sir. Thank you. Okay, madam. Thank you.